Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers? Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. It's Wednesday. It's hump day. We're getting towards the weekend. I'm ready for it. My son graduates from his fire academy on Friday. He has spent his whole summer at this academy except for weekends. Got his hazmat certification. He's so excited. I cannot wait to celebrate him on Friday. Okay, just a heads up. You guys might not see me for a while after tonight for a long time. And I'm going to tell you why. Because I'm about to win that Powerball. This up to $1 billion, So I will send some posts of my exotic travels and just giving you a heads up. Another thing I did today, I've had one of those 23andMe DNA kits since Christmas, and I finally spit in the little tube and sent it off today. So I'm super excited to learn about my ancestors and also to see if any of my distant relatives are connected to some unsolved murder. But hey, I guess we'll find out. Okay, cat owners, leave me some tips in the comments. Okay, I have indoor and outdoor cats, and I've talked about this last night daggum snake in my studio the cat was playing with it like it was nothing i said some curse words and freaked out called my dad who came and got it out of my house but how do you stop cats from bringing this stuff in i don't want them to be fully indoors but it may come to that because i don't play with snakes no 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 all right music fact of the day on his debut album for you released when he was 20 prince is said to have played every single instrument on that album, 27 in all. Love, Prince. All right, we're going to jump into this Carly Russell press conference that was held today. And boy, was it a doozy. The Hoover PD gave a presser today to update on their investigation into this case. And Carly is the woman who has been the subject of a frantic search after she made a 911 call on July 13th. Before the 911 call at 8.20 p.m., she left work, and surveillance shows Carly conceal a bathrobe, toilet paper, and other items belonging to the business. She ordered food from a place called Tzatziki's, and then she went to Target, where she bought granola bars and cheeses. She sat in the parking lot of that Target until 9.21 when she drove to I-459. She talked on the phone to unknown individuals until she called 911. They played the 911 call. And it says, there's a kid walking by themselves on the right side of the road. She said the child looks to be between three and four years old. Then she tells which exit she's at. She said she's still in her car and dispatch tells her to keep an eye on the kid. She says it's a boy who's wearing a white t-shirt with a diaper. She doesn't see any cars parked anywhere and dispatch just says to watch the child and that they have dispatched a unit to her location. After the 911 call, she called a family member who heard her talking to the alleged child on the road. Sometime after 9.36 p.m., she went missing. Screaming was heard on that call by the family member and then everything went silent. Her call was the only call they received claiming a child was on the side of the road. And also, there were no reports of any children being missing in the Hoover area. And Hoover PD did not locate any evidence of a child being on the side of the road. When police arrived on scene, they found the 25-year-old's car still running with her belongings inside. The data on her phone, including her Life360 app, showed that she traveled 600 yards in her car while on the phone with 911, stating that she was following the child. That's six football fields, just for reference. 911 received a second call from Carly's mother that night, stating Carly was on the phone with a relative when they heard Carly scream and then they heard just an open phone line and the noise of traffic. Police found her wig and cell phone in the grass and her purse was in the front seat of her car. Her Apple Watch was inside that purse. The food she ordered from that restaurant was in the car. The items she took from her place of employment and the items she bought in Target were not in the car. Hoover PD called in their drone unit, crime scene investigative unit, they brought out everybody. Locals started search parties. Throughout the day Friday, officers from surrounding areas joined that search and officers returned to the scene to conduct a line search for evidence. That's where everybody gets in a line and you walk and look for things. 
Those searches, of course, turned up no results. Then on Saturday, July 15th, her mother called 911 and said that she had returned home on foot. Surveillance showed her walking down the street alone prior to arriving at her parents' house. She was conscious and she was speaking with paramedics when she was transported to the hospital. Police were able to get a brief statement with her prior to her being treated and released. Carly told police she saw a baby walking down the side of the road and called 911. She said when she got out of her car to check on the child, a man approached from the wooded area and mumbled that he was checking on the baby. She said the man picked her up and she screamed. She said he made her go over a fence, forced her into a car, and the next thing she remembers is being in the trailer of an 18-wheeler. She said that she heard a female, but she never saw her. She also said she heard a baby crying. She said the man had orange hair with a big bald spot on the back. She said she was able to escape that 18-wheeler and fled on foot only to be captured again and put in a car. She said she was blindfolded but not tied up because the man said he did not want to leave impressions on her wrist. She said they took her to a house and made her get undressed. She believes they took pictures of her, but she says she doesn't remember any physical or sexual contact. The next day, she woke up and was fed cheese crackers by the female. The woman also played with her hair, and then she couldn't remember anything else. At some point, she was put back in a vehicle and was able to escape in the West Hoover area. She ran through a lot of woods and came out near her house. She did have a small injury to her lip, and she said her head was hurting. When she returned home, she had $107 in cash in her right sock. Detectives didn't press for additional information in that first interview. They wanted to give her time to rest. They're still analyzing data from her cell phone that was left at the scene, and the U.S. Secret Service is assisting with that right now. But part of that data included internet searches in the days leading up to this incident. On July 11th at 7.30 a.m., she searched, do you have to pay for an Amber Alert? The day she went missing at 1.03 a.m., how to take money from a register without being caught. Then at 2.13 a.m., Birmingham bus station. At 2.35 a.m., she searched one-way bus ticket from Birmingham to Nashville with the departure date of July 13th the day she went missing. Then at 10, 12 p.m., she Googles the movie Taken. That's a movie about an abduction. I think Liam Neeson is in that and his daughter gets gets taken. And there were two searches for Amber Alerts on her work computer, including the maximum age for an Amber Alert. He said there were other searches on her phone that may explain her mindset, but for her privacy, they're not going to reveal those right now. They have asked to interview Carly a second time, but they have not been given the opportunity. There are many questions left that only she can answer. They've been unable to verify most of her initial statements to investigators, and he made clear that the public knows they do not feel there is any threat to the public. A child has never been identified or found, and there were no reports of missing children. So it's an odd one. We'll follow it closely and see what happens. Let's move on to Rex Hewerman. And just real quick, uh, his wife filed for divorce today, by the way. I wanted to take a minute and just talk about the fact that these women who lost their lives to such an evil, evil person, you know, they're not just what they did. For work. These are women who were loved. They're women who had families. I've seen comments that sort of dismiss these women due to what they did. And we need to change that narrative. Men and women who do this for a living when things like this happen, because we don't know people's situations. We don't know what they're facing, what they faced. And I think their lives matter just as much as somebody who makes six figures a year and lives in a gated community. So I've been trying to find a little bit of information just about these women away from Rex and what were they like because their stories deserve to be told. Megan Waterman was 22. She had been taken by her boyfriend to New York in June of 2010 and she is believed to be a victim of sex trafficking. WMTW spoke to Megan's sister, Allie, who said she was just a normal person. She had a normal, loving heart, just like any person you walk next to on the sidewalk. 
She didn't deserve this, just like anyone else's mother, sister, or daughter deserved this. She really was a fabulous person, just lost in life. She had worked at some sandwich shops to scrape by. Her family blames an ex-boyfriend for her change in careers. He introduced her to the idea of doing this kind of work so she could support her children and, of course, him. Megan had a daughter who was three years old when she was killed. Now her daughter is in high school and she's doing well and she lives in Maine with a relative. Megan's mom said when Megan would travel without her child, she would call three times a day just to check on her little girl. June 5th, 2010 was the last time that her mother talked to Megan. Amber Castillo, she was 27. She was a native of North Carolina, actually born in Charlotte, but she was raised in Wilmington, North Carolina. Later on, she moved to Clearwater Beach, Florida. She was married from 2007 to 2010, and her ex-husband said she moved to New York after a falling out over her addiction issues, which began in her teen years. It is said she had a difficult childhood, and her older sister, Kimberly, told a news station that Amber had been molested at the age of six by a neighbor. She was doing really well in school until the addiction began with her. Addiction is a disease, it is something that a lot of people say, just stop, just stop. It's not that easy. It's kind of like a cancer. It may go away for a while. It may come back. It may come back worse. And my heart goes out to people that are in the throes of addiction because it's not like they want to live that life. They're stuck. It's just so sad. There are so many people. I know a lot of you out there have been touched by addiction personally or people you love. You know the struggles of seeing that cycle and unfortunately, it seems that she was caught in this cycle. Her cousin-in-law told WFLA that she was hyper, happy, and energetic. She never caused problems, and she also worked as a waitress at times. Her sister got her into a sober house in New York, and she later moved into an apartment. When Amber lost contact with her family, they just assumed maybe she had taken herself back to rehab. Her aunt told the Charlotte Observer that Amber was beautiful and she was a loving human being. Amber sang in the church choir and helped in the church nursery with the little babies. She had only been in New York for six months when she was murdered. Her family, believing she may have been in rehab, initially didn't report her missing. One common theme I've seen with the families when they speak out is that due to what these women were doing to make money, a lot of times they were not taken seriously when they did report their loved ones missing. Maureen, who was 25, she was born July 14th, 1982 in New London. She had been a dealer at Foxwoods Resort Casino dealing blackjack in Connecticut, and she also worked at a shop right. She was described by her big sister, Melissa, as a free spirit. She was artistic and daring. She also had two children. She was said to be doing this work just to keep her mortgage payments up, and she had gotten out of it but returned to it when she got an eviction notice. She was also working at a motel in Manhattan when she disappeared. A friend told the Bulletin in Norwich in January 2011 that Maureen had a lot of energy and thought everybody was her friend. Melissa, who was 24, she was from Erie, New York, graduated high school in 2003, and she earned her cosmetology license. She was employed as a hairstylist before moving to the city. She had dreams of finding a more glamorous job, and her goal was to own her own salon. When she moved to the city, she rented a basement apartment in the Bronx, and her landlord said she was a sweet girl and a good tenant. Melissa's sister was the one that Rex was calling, and get this, her sister was 15 years old at the time. Her sister told PIX11 News Rex knew her name the sister, and also what she looked like. We know he was Googling family members. We saw that from the documents that were released. You know, one thing is all these women were close to their families. It's not like they were out there on their own. And even if they were, it's just so sad what happened to them. And my heart goes out to these women and their families and these children that now have no mother. These women were doing the best they could in life, y'all. They were doing everything they could to just get by. I hope that these families now have a little bit of peace now that there's been an arrest and now we move on to the judicial process. And again, I do not think this is going to be the last of the victims we hear. I think we haven't even scratched the surface. Somebody like that doesn't stop for years. And... I will not be surprised when we get more news that other victims have been tied to Rex, allegedly. And I say allegedly because I don't want to get sued.
And now a word from our sponsor of the week, EasyCanvasPrints.com. Canvas prints make the perfect decor for any home. They're the perfect way to make your best memories last a lifetime. Are you looking to turn cherished memories into stunning home decor? Easy Canvas Prints is the perfect way to transform your favorite pictures into beautiful masterpieces. With Easy Canvas Prints, you can bring your memories to life, adding a touch of elegance and personalization to any space. Whether it's a family portrait, a breathtaking landscape, or a candid moment captured in time, Canvas Prints will make your walls come alive. Ordering your custom canvas print is a breeze. All you do is visit easycanvasprints.com and upload your favorite photo. You can customize the size, borders, and even a custom wooden or metallic frame to create a unique piece of art. Don't wait to elevate your home or office decor with a custom canvas print today. Visit easycanvasprints.com slash pretty lies for a special offer for my listeners. Get unlimited 16 by 20 canvas prints for only $14.99 each. Again, that's easycanvasprints.com slash pretty lies. I mentioned earlier that his wife Asa had filed for divorce. By the way, Asa was what I was actually going to name my son Mason. That was my great grandfather's name, but we decided on Mason. That was my husband's brother's name who passed away. So he was almost an Asa, just a random fact. Um, but she filed for an uncontested divorce today. She chose to file closer to where Rex is being held as opposed to closer to their home. The lawyer for Asa and her children said this is still a whirlwind. Hers and her children's lives have been completely turned upside down. His brother lives in Chester, South Carolina, where Rex has bought property, and we know he planned to retire there. There is a sign on his brother's gate that says, no warrant, no entry. Rex's Chevy Avalanche was taken from here in South Carolina from his brother's house. WSOC TV flew over that property of his brother's, and they saw piles of debris, one structure, and a canopy tent set up. So I was looking into the tax assessor's website today, and Rex has four properties he's purchased here in Chester. They're all together in little lots, so it seems like he and his brother have bought up a lot of land that just kind of all intersects together and, and makes one huge piece of land. He paid his taxes in March of this year. It looks like his brother, by the way, has unpaid taxes on the property and other things. So lot 67 appraised at 45000 and he paid $1,395 in taxes on that. Lot 61 appraised at $40,000, he paid $1,240 in taxes. Lot 66 appraised at 45500 Taxes paid on that were $1,411. And lot 85 appraised at 50000 and taxes paid were 1550 Neighbors of Rex's brother Craig say he comes off as a bit odd. One neighbor says that he is a doomsday prepper and his yard is full of junk. One neighbor said Craig has a rule not to cut grass on Sunday. So one person cut grass one Sunday on a property across from Craig. According to the neighbor, Craig proceeds to hit the neighbor over the head with a steel pole. The neighbor said he was ready to shoot Craig, but his wife talked him out of it. When police talked to Craig, he said, well, I told him not to cut grass on Sunday. Why would you not cut grass on Sunday? Like, what, what's the rule? I don't get it. Craig also would hand out business cards to people on his street that included his name, followed by the words, bad mother effer. And it had his phone number on it. Moving back over to Rex, one of his neighbors said he had to confront Rex about looking over the fence at his wife while she was sunbathing. We're starting to hear from people who have had contact with him. And I find it very interesting to see behavior patterns and kind of put all these together to see how he was under, I guess, normal circumstances. A woman took to TikTok to talk about a date 10 years ago with Rex. And in fact, I believe Laura Mathias from Hidden True Crime has interviewed this woman Check out her podcast page or YouTube page to see the full interview. I plan on watching it right after this. But this was about 10 years ago, and she said the date started out pretty normal but turned creepy. They met at a seafood restaurant almost an hour away from Rex's house. She said it started off with some small talk, and then he asked her if she liked true crime. And she told him she knew more about serial killers than their own mothers did. He then asked if she knew anything about the Gilgo Beach murders. She said, everybody on Long Island does. We're all following that case. 
She said he started spouting off things about the case and mentioned a body that had not been announced yet on the news. And she said when he was talking about these murders, he perked up, sat up straighter, and seemed excited. After the day ended, he asked if she wanted to go back to his place, and she said that she didn't know because she would have to follow him in her car. And he said she could just ride with him and leave her car there. She said there was no way she was leaving her car in a random place in Port Jeff. She said he turned angry and insistent. She said, thank God she trusted her gut and she never spoke to Rex again. So I did a little bit of research about serial killers. It's a fascinating topic. It's a, it's a terrible topic. But there's always been this question in me, nature versus nurture. Is somebody born that way or are they made that way? Is it a combination? But I just found some interesting things that I wanted to share with you before we end this episode. America's first serial killer is considered to be Dr. H.H. H. Holmes, who confessed to 27 murders in the late 1890s. He said, I was born with the devil in me. I could not help the fact that I was a murderer. No more than a poet can help the inspiration to sing. Crime stats say there could be as many as 2,000 active serial killers in the U.S. alone. But if you look at it from a numbers standpoint, out of the 15 plus thousand murders in the U.S. every year, only 150 of those would be from a serial killer, making 1% of the murders in this country the work of a serial killer. That's still 1% too many. Serial killers are frequently found to have an unusual or unnatural relationship with their mothers. The movie Psycho kind of revolved around this idea and Hitchcock was the one who kind of thought this up, but it ended up having some credibility to it. Many serial killers were abused or beaten as children, but there are exceptions. For example, Jeffrey Dahmer had a very normal upbringing, but became, as we know, one of the worst horrible serial killers in modern time. I cannot watch that special on him. My teenagers did, and it freaked them out. And I, it's just a little much for me. I can't stand to watch anything that shows... Uh, anybody being tortured, even if it's fake, I, I just can't. It's especially when it's based on true story. So I haven't brought myself to watch that yet. Jeffrey Dahmer's father wrote a book, A Father's Story, which searches for explanations for his son's behavior. A study that focused on a group of sociopaths who had been adopted as infants showed that the biological relatives of sociopaths were four to five times more likely to be sociopathic than the average person. Researchers note that it's easy for bad seeds to blossom in bad environments. So that is kind of that nature and nurture working together that just creates monsters. Many serial killers report having an abnormally strong sex drive and many fantasized about dead women rather than living ones. However, not all serial killers have sexual motivation. Anger, thrill-seeking, financial gain, and attention-seeking were also found to be big motivators for serial killers. Studies have shown that serial killers have a higher fear threshold. For instance, in one study, the startle reaction was observed to be way lower in serial killers than in the average person. This shows a need for a higher level of thrill or stimulation to have an intense experience. Serial killers often keep souvenirs from their victims. In fact, that's one thing they are searching his house for or these storage units to see if Rex kept any kind of mementos from his victims. In fact, Ted Bundy, who kept Polaroids of the women he killed, once said, when you work hard to do something, you don't want to forget it. Nearly 70% of serial killers had extensive head injuries as children or adolescents, which researchers say may suggest a link between head injuries and serial murder. From a scientific standpoint, researchers think chromosome abnormalities could be a trigger for serial killers. Most men who become serial killers begin to develop and display their tendencies during puberty, which is when certain chromosomal abnormalities begin to present. There's no exact gene that has been identified, but a change in a killer's chromosomal makeup is being studied. I've seen brain scans of serial killers where they show that their normal brain everyday function is very different than ours. All that's fascinating. I wish I had time to really dive into it and study stuff like that. Maybe one day I will, but not today. Some researchers believe that the prefrontal cortex, which is the area that helps with planning and judgment, does not function properly in psychopaths. 
Three warning signs of future psychopathic behavior in children and adolescents are number one, animal torture. Number two, prolonged bedwetting into adolescence. Number three, juvenile pyromania. This idea was introduced in 1963, and over the years, they have learned that big egos, a lack of responsibility, and extreme risk-taking behavior could also be warning signs. 65% of victims of a serial killer are women. So what's the difference between a sociopath and a psychopath? Sociopaths struggle to relate to others or form mental and emotional bonds, but they do have the capacity to do so. Psychopaths often display an inability to feel emotions, or if they do, they override those emotions. They can fake emotions. Psychologists believed this is a learned behavior to fake emotions that some killers can mimic. Just look at Ted Bundy. He had charisma, which was used to lure his victims. He also worked at a suicide prevention hotline center, and he saved a child from drowning. Most serial killers fall into the psychopath category. The motives of serial killers typically fall into four different categories. Men make up the majority of serial killers at a percentage of over 90%, and majority are white males. Serial killers tend to stay in the same area in what is called a killing comfort zone. There's a misconception that serial killers have a higher IQ than the general population, but studies have shown as a whole, serial killers have average to slightly below average IQs. Of course, there are exceptions. Again, look at Ted Bundy, who was a very, very smart man. Here's a scary one. It's possible you may walk past 36 serial killers in your entire lifetime. 70% of all known serial killer murders come from the United States. There are six phases of the serial killer's cycle. The aura phase, where the serial killer begins to lose a grip on reality. Number two, the trolling phase, when the killer searches for their victims. Number three, the wooing phase, where the killer lures his victims in. Number four, the capture phase, when the victim is entrapped. Number five, the murder or totem phase, which is the emotional high for the killer. And finally, the depression phase, which occurs after the killing. That came from the A to Z Encyclopedia of Serial Killers. Psychopaths can seem normal and often charming. Psychiatrists call this the mask of sanity. Many serial killers are fascinated by authority, and it's common for serial killers to have tried to become people in positions of authority, such as police officers, security guards, or positions of protection. Some serial killers have disguised themselves as public servants to gain access to their victims. Ted Bundy, the Hillside Strangler, and John Gacy did. Studies have indicated 11 characteristics common to serial killers. They are a lack of empathy, a lack of remorse, being impulsive, delusions of grandeur, narcissism, superficial charm, manipulation, addictive personality, a lust for power, sensation seeking. And that's just a few things that I uncovered today. I think it's just interesting as a whole to study this as far as the mind. I don't know that we'll ever really crack what makes these people do what they do. I don't think it's something that can be understood. I believe they took Ted Bundy's brain and kept that for research, if I'm not mistaken. You know, it's, it's just a reminder to be safe. Not everybody who's been killed by a serial killer is somebody who does what these victims do for a living. It's been average people um, just normal people. And all we can do is hope and pray that we never become a statistic. So that's all for now. It seems like things just every hour are coming out. People are speaking out about this case. So we're going to keep going on this tomorrow if there's enough information. One thing that I did see on Twitter, it looks like they're kind of blocking that house with big police vehicles. Alex from News Nation is on scene and tweeted out, police are beginning to reposition their vehicles, I believe, in an attempt to obstruct our view. It tells me they have found something big and they're waiting to bring it out. I asked a detective. He told me no comment. You can follow Alex on Twitter. It's A-L-C-A-P-R-A-R-I-23. He's there and providing updates. Also, big shout out to Jay at The Shaming of Jay. 
He is on Twitter and has been live streaming from outside the residence until his phone died, but he was there for quite a while. And it was nice to see some insight into what's happening. A lot of neighbors, a lot of people are coming from other places just to watch the activity at the house. But anyways, that's all for today, you guys. I hope you have a good rest of your evening. We will see you tomorrow.